and welcome another Saturday in the camp. Uh, we are here today to learn with Master Beekeeper Kareen Pulikane about honeybee products. Kareen is a master beekeeper with the California Master Beekeeper Program. She's also the volunteer team lead at the South Coast Research and Extension Center in Irvine. And uh, basically with a dozen other volunteers keeps that apiary in Irvine up and running, tends to the bees. Kareen comes to us with a bevy of experience, not only in beekeeping, but also in education. Uh, Kareen worked with Dr. Marla Spivak back in Minnesota. That's where she got her bee bug, I guess you could call it. <laughs> That's where she became really interested in bees. Well, she was attending at the University of Minnesota um, uh, for uh, a master's in uh, agriculture uh, and uh, geography uh, and um, with a with a, a special a specialty in in uh, education um, and I'm doing this off the top of my head Kareen so please jump in to correct me whenever um, I'm I'm not on the right path but what I do know about Kareen is uh, her joy enthusiasm and passion for beekeeping and beekeeping education. So I look forward to jumping on this ride with everybody here and learning about honeybee products today. So welcome, Kareen. Thank you for, as always, your generosity of time and uh, sharing your knowledge with us today regarding honeybee products. Thank you, Wendy. Very nice introduction. Let me um... Let me share my screen with you. And I guess it's this one. And uh, good yeah. morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today on this uh, Easter weekend. Before I start, I would like to acknowledge Wendy. She's being a very big supporter of, of ours here in uh, Irvine. So Wendy is the camp program manager. She's been a beekeeper since 2007 and she's a California master beekeeper. She also owned and operated an, um, an operation, a sideline operation in central Ontario, which averages 1000 kilograms. For you that are not so familiar, 1000 kilo, 1, kilograms is about 2,200 pounds of clean wildflower honey, honey each year. She also worked as a honey bee health tech representative for NOD apiary products in Canada and the US. And um, she also is a social service worker. So this is why she's very kind to us and an adult educator. And she taught community development. She also did program design and portfolio development at Realist Col College in Belleville, Ontario. She enjoys Seriously, sharing a passion for honeybees, we all know that. She's a great educator uh, and a great environmental, uh, environmental stewardship and program design for camp. And like I said, supports us here at Camp OC um, all the way to 1000%. And we are very, very uh, happy to have her on our side. So thank you for all your good work, Wendy. and. Um, she is also a good friend of mine. So let's start, get started with our honeybee uh, products today. Um, I really like this class and um, usually we do that in person and I bring things, uh, you know, honey and beeswax and pollen and propolis and royal jelly, but uh, we are going to do it um, still on Zoom. Hopefully soon we are gonna be uh, out and in the classroom and that would be awesome. So today we're gonna talk about obviously what are the products of the hive? Sometimes we kind of forget it's just not only honey. We also can, um, we have beeswax, pollen, propolis, royal jelly, and I'm going to talk a little bit about epitherapy. So the honey, what's honey? It's produced by the bees, we all know that, but it's a food, food source for them. The nectar, the nectar is gathered and then it's written inside the hive. 
nectar is about 60% water content when it comes and to the hive and it needs to be reduced to about 18% to be called honey. So if your honey is not you know, 18 or less, it's not honey, okay? It cannot be called like that. Honey is made of two simple sugars and we'll go over a little later, but it's really glucose and fructose. Those are the two main um, component of honey. I think I skipped one. Yes, the honey attributes or characteristic. This is, uh, I'm gonna, I took that uh, information from the camp uh, study notes for the apprentice level. We learned that in our classes and I thought it was very interesting and I wanted to share it with you. So the color is very important, the flavor and the aroma. So for the colors, the pigments and the nectar a component range from clear to very, very dark. You see the top picture on the right? I mean, those are all beautiful honey, edible and tasting different, right? But you can see when they're all lined up together that, oh yeah, we have different colors. So sometimes we kind of forget that it's not only one color that we see at the store. The flavor, well, it depends on the plant compound, obviously, and the nectar. And then in the flavor, we have the varietal or the mixture of uh, flavors. And varietal honey means it's a honey that's made with about with one type of uh, single type of flowers. For instance, it's also called you maybe know monofloral um, honey. And this is for exa example, if you see on the label, it says um, raspberry honey or meadow foam honey from Oregon. We have those beautiful honey. So monofloral or varietal is the same. It means the same. Mixture, obviously it's a mix of different honey, different compound plants. The aroma, well, the aroma, it comes from the alcohols and the ketones and aldehyde and ester that is in the, um, in the honey. So this is all the chemical identity of honey that is in each and every honey. So it's different in everyone. In the US, we have no standards for um, identifying the honey. There's no law required. In Europe, any varietal honey, so anything we say it's gonna be meadow foam or others, strawberry, raspberry, whatever it is, it needs to be analyzed using the international standard and, and the international, international standards and has to conform to the Codex Alimentaris. And this is, uh, it's a collection of standards and guidelines and codes of practice that are um, known you know, over the world and followed. This analyze, it has to be done in a lab. And then you receive a ticket a paper saying, yes, your honey is really um, raspberry, meadow foam, orange, whatever it is. Um, so in Europe, it's a little bit more stringent, but it's okay. We like our honey in, in the US as well. So how honey, is made. It's always a question that we get, and it's, it's not very simple, actually. I find it very fascinating that a little teeny honeybee can do that. I mean, we, we cannot create honey ourselves, human beings. We go to the moon, we do this, we do that, but we cannot replicate honey. So I'm going to discuss the how it is, um, it is done from A to Z, and you will see how much um, effort and the things that we don't know about the honeybee, what she does. So the nectar first is gathered by the forager bees. Very simple, we know that, we see that. Then the bees, the uh, ingest the, uh, the, the nectar in their honey stomach, which is called a crop. Then it is mixed with beneficial bacteria and enzyme right there in their honey stomach, okay? Then the envertase, this is the enzyme that breaks down the sugars, it gives us two sugars that we talked about before, the glucose and the fructose. So this is all in the forager's stomach, right? The foragers then come back to the hive, they regurgitate the mixture to the house bees. So they are just sitting there and waiting for the foragers to come back. And the house bees, they will add some more enzymes to convert the nectar mixture, because it's not a honey yet, to produce honey. Okay, so this mixture then is placed into the cell, into the combs, 
and the bees, they have to fan their wings to increase the water evaporation from the nectar. Remember it was 60% water about, we need to go to 18.6%. The bees are extraordinarily knowledgeable. I don't know where they went to school, but they know absolutely when it is 18.6%. We don't know that. We need to use a, a tool, a refractometer, to measure the water content in the, in the honey. But the bees, they know it. So this decrease in water content obviously raises the sugar level. And then that is why it's preventing also fermentation. You know, we always tell you, you know, have your honey at least at 18.6 or lower, then it won't uh, ferment. So when this process is done, the bees, what do they do? So they know it's 18.6. Well, they're gonna put a little layer of wax on top of the little um, cell, close it, seal it, and good to go. And now, just now it's called honey. Then, and then the honey is ripping and it's stored forever. If you, you know, you come back in two years, 10 years, and you have the same frame with the honey in the hive, it will be good to, to eat. So I feel it's fantastic <laughs> what they can do. And I, I love to share with you this process. Um, if you can remember and tell your friends, that's pretty good. Uh, the top five honey producing country as of 2019, uh, China, Turkey, Canada, Argentina, and Iran. Um, honey is the most tainted food in America. Uh, the bees, they pollinate about 20 billion worth of American crop every year. And the strong honey industry is absolutely vital for the US food supply. The American consume more honey than any nation on earth. And I did not realize that when I started researching it, but it's not because, well, first of all, they, it's over 500 million pounds a year. So you guys are eating a lot, but no. Actually, I'm not talking about the personal consumption. I'm talking about the honey that our country use is in the restaurant mainly and the baking industry, as well as all the processed food that we have, okay? So it's not the, it's not the personal consumption. Europeans usually have uh, consume more per person. But the problem that we have because we use so much honey is the US meets half of the demand for our country. So this is why China, we go to China, it's the number one producer. I've, I've just looked at the um, USDA production report actually last week and they, um, they had the 2021 report and uh, we produce, the US, we produce 126 million pounds of honey, but that was down from uh, the year before. 2020, 14% down. In the last two decades, we lost about 20% of our honey production. The only thing that's going positive for us is the, the honey, the price of honey is going up by about 21%. And this is the, the reports from the USDA. So I think um, even though we, are, we don't have too, too much honey, we know that uh, you know we need to have more beekeepers, but uh, we know also that it's difficult to keep bees. So we're gonna keep working at it, I guess. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about how come China is number one producer in the world. Um, there's a few things. In rural China, there's a lot of cooperative. So some very, very small family operation. Look here on the picture on the right. It's really artisanal. I mean, it's not you know clean or anything like that. They just have the honey, get the honey from their hives, put it in a, in a big jar like this, and then the truck comes and then gather all um, the honey from different places, um, different part of the world, of, of their world. So China leads in the world in number of hives and honey production, but they get less honey per hive than we do. The US gets an average about 47 pounds, but they have way more uh, honey hive, oh, honey hive, they have beehives than we do. So they get more output. This is how they, they have everything. Oh, they have more honey than we, we do. Um, on top of that, 
everything at their, in, in China, most of it is done by hand because um, labor is very cheap. So they go out and they do everything um, by hand and then they can, we can, they can have more honey to uh, sell on the market. In 2001, the American government accused three companies of importing millions of dollars worth of rice fructose that was blended and uh, with uh, honey. And that was mostly taxable honey. And the importers said that the product was less than 50% honey. Some people went to jail because you cannot do that. You cannot mix you know, some honey with other things. And uh, we didn't have, in 2001, we didn't have any way of testing or you know, have a lab checking all the barrels that were coming. And, uh, but they, uh, they figure out that there was something fishy about it. So they decided to kind of, to, in 2001, they, they started to investigate this problem. In, two, in September, 2019, uh, the, co the Commerce Department imposed a major tariff on the honey coming from China. And that was about 25%. And that was put in to protect the American producers because otherwise, you know, if their honey is $1 a pound, I mean, we cannot compete here in the US. We cannot produce honey at $1 a pound. So, but the China, they were pretty smart to avoid those stiff taxes. They were shipping honey from other parts using other ports. So every time you were coming to a port, they changed the label. They would put, you know, Philippines or whatever. So, oh, okay, it's not China. So when they came here in the US to our ports, well, it says, uh, you know, Philippines, we don't need to test them, that honey and it was going in, coming in. But uh, they, all, they discovered that those barrels uh, were not even honey at all. All those, you know, uh, bad honey, I guess. Uh, it was a mix with corn and rice sweetener. And on top of that, <laughs> the chemist found Chinese honey containing a lot of harmful uh, antibiotics, lead, molasses, fructose, and farm chemicals, because they were not tested when they got out of China. So that's, what, um, that's why we ended up with uh, this problem in our country, because we need to import so much for our own uh, baking and restaurants industry. So in conclusion, I said that I think you should have your own personal hive, even only one, or you can visit your local farmers because then this person will tell you exactly where the hives are located and you can discuss. And I think it's, um, it's kind of a bit safer. But that's our take on that. So a honey adulteration. Um, I have an article, I think that um, that's interesting for you guys to read and uh, probably Wendy will put it in the notes, but What's adulteration? It, the definition is, is very important. It's, it's the action of making something poorer in quality by adding other substances, okay? While importing honey, accidental uh, contamination of food supply exists. I mean, we know here, sometimes, you know, you get an alert, um, don't, you know, all the lettuce are gonna be re uh, removed from, from the store, et cetera, et cetera. Accidental happens, but intentional, uh, adulteration of food uh, for economic gains um, that has been seen recently. You may remember, I think it was early 2000, 2010, something like that, um, the pet food crisis. You know, the cat and food uh, di died after eating some contaminated food. Well, it was revealed later that it contained melamine and cyanuric acid. So fraud happened and we have to be vigilant and the US are pretty good now at detecting um, something that's not right. So this is how fraud, honey fraud happens. It's sometimes mixed with corn syrup or rice sweetener. So you can see it. It's ultra filtered or heated and exa exaggerated heated. So basically when you look at it, there's no pollen and all the property, the honey properties are destructed. I mean, they're done. They're, we don't have that. We also, they also are able to detect all the banned antibiotics. And to detect this type of frauds, well, the USDA invested a lot of money um, using mass spectrometry and chromatography to measure and detect the level of 
chromium, iron, copper, and other trace elements to several parts per quadrillion. So they cannot really cheat anymore if we are using those tools because they found out that each combination of trace uh, metals, they reflect the composition of a, a specific soil on the planet. So the plants is uptaking those trace elements and the bees pick them up when collecting the nectar and pollen. So if your honey, it says, comes from X, Y, and Z, and then you look at the, the trace metal elements and it's not there, that means it's fraud. It's not true. It does not happen. So um, we're very grateful that they can do that, but obviously um, they cannot check every barrel. So this is um, what happened with our honey. We just have to be vigilant. Any question on this? Okay, we are going to talk about the typical honey composition. Like I said, the two main, the main, the main culprits are the fructose and the glucose. And you see the ratio is 38 to 31. So this is important for later, I'll tell you. Uh, the water is about 17%. And they have other sugar, and we also have a bit. I was surprised. We also have a bit, a bit of ash in there. Um, to reference the table sugar, table sugar is about fifty. Not about. It is fifty percent fructose and fifty percent glucose. Okay, instead of thirty-eight, thirty-one ratio. So that's that's important difference. So we've got some physical and chemical properties. Um, and this phenomenon of crystallization and granulation, for instance, is affected by that ratio, the ratio of the main sugars, the glucose and the fructose. The more glucose than fructose, it will um, granulate faster, okay? If you have more glucose and less fructose, it will granulate. The temperature has to be between 55 and 63 degrees. Uh, Fahrenheit, so this is 13 to about 18 Celsius, and there's more crust crystallization and wa water content. Remember, if your honey is less than 18 points, you have an excellent honey. It's just perfect. Something we can do if our honey crystallize to liquefy your honey again, you're going to use a double boiler pot, very, very, very low temperature, okay, because you don't want to destroy all the beneficial um, characteristic of honey, so very, very low. Please don't put your honey in the microwave. It's too, it's too br br brutal. I mean, it's gonna destroy all the honey properties and you're gonna just have a liquid that's, well, it's pretend honey. You don't want that, okay? Another um, property that's pretty important is the viscosity. And the viscosity is, you know, remember, it's how, how you can pour it. It affect, it's affected by water content and the temperature. When it's warmer and more humid, well, the easier the honey will flow. Okay, you want more viscosity when you extract or you bottle your honey, okay? I was uh, like, like Wendy, I was in a harsh place before. I was in Minnesota for 20 years and also we do harvest our honey. Uh, actually, we, we did that with our kids too. Uh, uh, it was Labor Day weekend, and Liberty weekend in Minnesota. Well, it's cold. It's uh, you know we have we starting to have um, frozen ground and etc. So we were pulling all the honey frames and everything. We're doing that in our unheated garage, and it's freezing. And we had to actually put some um, uh, heaters on top of the extractor to make the honey flow because otherwise we were just sitting there and nothing was coming out. It was drip, drip, drip. So um, yes. Uh, this is where the viscosity, you know, the temperature is important. So we were just warming up um, the extraction, the extractor, the metal. So, it, and then we would make the, um, the honey flow a little bit better for us. But that was funny. We don't do that in here. We don't need to. So another thing that's very important and kind of strange, but they have, uh, honey has electrical and optic, op optical properties. And this is, very interesting. The honey contains electrolytes. Yeah, that's understand. You know, we understand that. There's a, this is acid and minerals. And there's also a various degree of uh, electrical conductivity because remember that the trace metal elements 
from different parts of the world, well, that is reflected in the, in the EC of most uh, useful, it's a quality that is used as a parameter to classify actually unifloral honeys. So the electrical conductivity, we, could, we can test that in the unifloral honey and we can know exactly if that honey is the honey that we think it is. So it's, a, it's something that can be measured. So it's objective. It's not like, oh, it looks like this. No, we have a number. So that's important. Uptake Well, the effect that honey has done on the light is useful to determine um, the type and the quality of honey. For instance, if we're to see that, we can use a uh, polariscope or crystal detector. And this crystal detector can really detect anything very, very, very small, tiny crystals, dust particles, and it can also see grain of pollens. So this is very important to use light. Actually, my husband this past week worked and made me a polariscope. So I'm gonna use it with my students and we're gonna see um, if we can see anything through the bottles. It's pretty impressive. I mean, I looked and I'm like, oh, we can see a lot of things in there. Um, it's, uh, it's amazing. Uh, the variation in uh, water content changes the reflective um, index. So the index is measured with the refractometer, like I told you. So we just put a little drop of honey in the a little window and we look through a tube and we can um, see a gauge. And if it's at 18.6, that's a question you quiz. Did you not know that? 18.6, this is a question. The answer is B of water content and drier. And this, you know, you have no risk of fermentation because it's very sad if you bottle your honey and it's, let's say it's, it's uh, you're gonna tell me, oh, 19% is not bad. Well, it's not bad if you consume it like right away, but if you are to store it in your cupboard or somewhere, it will ferment and it's not good. I mean, you know, you work so hard to get honey, uh, try to have it uh, very dry or lo low, lower concentration of uh, water. Another thing that you have to be aware of is when you enter your honey in honey competitions. All those physical properties that I talk about, they can be assessed and graded. So it's a number. It's not, you know, oh, I feel like it's this. No, we're going to have a number for it. So it's important for you to really make sure that your honey is at, you know, lower uh, water content. And usually the clubs, your, uh, your bee clubs, they have a refractometer. So before you submit to your honey, actually you can bring a little jar. You just need a, a drop and they can test it. It takes uh, about two seconds to see uh, what is the water content. And that's a good number um, for you to know. And if it's too wet, well, you need to extract the water of it. Um, another property, Agroscopic. What does that mean, agroscopic? I'm always using big words here. Yes, you're right. right. It's the only ability to absorb moisture from the air. That's important. This is a very great property. It, be, it benefits actually the baking industry. This is why we use it in the, our bake, baking industry. It keeps the baked goods with honey moist and soft. So think about when you, bu you buy things you know, at the store, the baker. It's moist, it takes, you know, you can leave it on the counter for a little bit, countertop for a little bit, it's gonna be still soft. And the, what's interesting about honey is that in the bakery industry, they use, they like to use honey because they use less than sugar because the, the fructose and glucose ratio of the honey is 38, 31 instead of 50, 50 with the, uh, with the sugar. So this is why the honey is a little sweeter. You use less. So it's a big, uh, big, big um, positive for bakers. It's also used in cosmetic industry for exactly the same, same reason, the ability to absorb moisture. Um, sometimes it says on your jar of face cream. So acid content, this is something that we are always surprised, but the average pH of honey is 3.9. And then I look at it and orange juice is about 3.30 to 5.15. So honey is pretty acidic. And sometimes we don't feel like this because maybe because it's sweet, but honey contains also both amino and organic acids. 
Honey is very good, actually. It's a very good uh, product. So different forms of honey. Um, honey is packaged and, and, and sold uh, in different forms around the country, around the world, I guess, also. We have comb honey. This is the picture here on the left, on the upper left. Um, we also have crystallized honey. We have cut combs. We have liquid honey. And we have whipped or cream honey. Um, I know in Europe they like, we like, I like the crystallized honey. It's the picture on the right. It's just because it's like, like a candy. <laughs> so you spread that. And the best way to eat this uh, type of uh, crystallized honey is you have a baguette, you put a ton of butter on top, and then you put, you slather that with honey. Oh my goodness, it's so good. It's perfect. I'm telling you, it's such a good snack. I like it. You should try. So I want you to impress your friends, you know, when you are, well, you're gonna have Easter soon. So I want you to be able to, you know, shine. And you can say those facts that are real. So the average worker makes one twelfth of a teaspoon in a lifetime. One twelfth, you guys. So when you have a, and you decide to take a big spoonful of it, think about it, how many bees worked to make your little, or your big fat tablespoon of honey. Um, also, uh, honeybees, they must visit about 2 million flowers to make one pound of honey. That's pretty impressive. And it would take about two tablespoons of honey to fuel a bee to fly around the world. Well, I think it would take more than two tablespoons of honey for me to walk at the end of my block, but that's okay. All right. We're going to talk a little bit about the culture and folklore. Um, in a lot of culture, we uh, there, there's honey mentioned, and I thought it was um, a little. Uh, it was a good idea to just talk about it a little bit, and you guys can go and investigate. I think it's fascinating. Uh, honey has some religious significance throughout the world. Um, for instance, in the Hinduism, the honey is one of the fifth um, five elix elixirs of immortality. It's really revered as a health food. And the other four uh, elixirs of immortality, if you want to know, it's milk, yogurt, sugar, and ghee. This is clarified butter made from buffalo or cows, and it's um, involved usually in, um, in the South Asian cuisine. In the Jewish tradition, honey is a symbol of New Year. For, for instance, I know that my friend, they always give me apples dipped in honey. And they, uh, they always give me good positive vibes. In the Christian and the New Testament, in the Gospel of Matthew, in the fourth verse, it says that John the Baptist is said to have lived a very long period of time in wilderness eating locusts and wild honey. Well, you know, that's great because locusts, this is your protein right there and honey it is your carb. So I guess this is true. In the Islamic faith, there's a whole chapter on bees actually, where the prophet Muhammad strongly recommends honey, but for healing purposes. Actually, the Quran promotes honey as a health and nutritious food. This is to, as you can see, honey is a special properties. I've been known a very long time. We are just kind of going back to loving honey and making sure that we're using it in a proper in a proper way or in a medicinal way. Um, I guess we must have forgotten about this during the modernization period that we went through and only recently rediscovered it because I feel that there's more um, words about maybe fitness, health food, and honey, I guess, is part of being a, health, a healthy food. Any question on that section? It's all good. Okay. The honey classification. That's big. There's a um, honey is classified by its floral source, obviously, right? But there's also division according to packaging and processing that's used. There are also regional honey. Honey is graded on its color and optical. Um, density by the USDA standards. We cannot just make it up. It, they have standards. We use a scale that's called the phone scale, which range the honey from, remember, 
the water white honey that we saw, that was about a zero to the very dark 114. And this is very dark. It's called dark amber honey. And this is in this country. We use a scale like that. So the floral source means what? It means that the source of nectar from which it is made. What flower, flower the bee is visiting? That's very important. A blend, when you see that on the, on the bottle, what does it mean? It means that the, it's a mixture of two or more uh, honey, honey. Different floral source, colors, flavor, density, or even geographic um, origin. So you can have different uh, honey from, let's say, Switzerland and France together, and this is a blend, okay? Or it can be two different flowers. So it's also called a blend. The polyfloral means that the, it's wildflower honey. And that means it's derived from the nectar of many, many type of flowers. And this is what we see most of the time we see on our bottles. You go to your store and just check it out. It says white flower, okay? And mono floral means one. So Primarily, it's one type of flower. For instance, we see a lot of um, clover or orange blossom. Uh, you can see some different, uh, different honey like this. And this is only one flower in this honey, okay? Different floral honey have distinctive flavor and colors. Why? Well, because this is the difference between the principal nectar source, okay? So monofloral, you'll see difference in color. So to produce the monofloral honey, the beekeeper has to keep his beehive in an area where the bees have access to only one type of flower. So I go back to my raspberry field because, um, because we did that in Minnesota. The people were, um, beekeepers were taking all their hives and for a certain period of time, boom, they were putting all their hives in the raspberry field. After when the flowers were pollinated and there was nothing else to eat, they just you take back the hives, put them in their truck and harvest right away that honey. Okay, they don't take the bees somewhere else because they don't want it to have it mixed. And usually those, those honey, those specific honey uh, have a premium. I mean, they, you pay a lot of money for um, a, a monofloral honey. Uh, that's, in, that's important. And um, that's all I have to say on this one. See, this is a Foon scale. So it's just, a, it, or the Jack scale, it's a color grader, like I told you. So you see on the right inside, the first uh, slice is very, very pale. And then you go to the left, the last slice of this, um, the, this scale is very, very dark. And the scale is used in, in the honey industry to describe the color of honey. The measurement was um, made with, the, with that grader which consists of a wedge of amber color glass. Actually, you take those little, uh, the little pots there, you put a little bit of honey and you just carry it over um, the slices to see what color it is fitting actually, okay? And the color, I want you to, tell, to let you know that is not a factor in determining the grades of the honey in the United States, okay? A color is also only a designation, usually a, a accompanied by the grade. The color grade is officially approved device to determine the color designation when applying this. Um, this officially approved device for determining the color designation when applying this unit state grade standards for the color of honey. Instead, the transmittance is measured at a wavelength of some nanometers. And this is done in a lab and this is the USA standard. We don't use that when we just sell our honey or we just have our honey. This, but we have, this is the only standard we have in the US, okay? It's this color grading scale. And you have more information. It's, it's a, there's a big standard book and so it's called the units, United States Standard for Grade of Extracted Honey. It's the USDA that produced this. And uh, it has been effective since 1985. So we can find this and you can go and, and look for this um, kind of scale. It does not concern us really, but um, beekeeper, the commercial beekeepers um, use this kind of scale. So the melisopalinology, what is that? First of all, it's a Greek name, right? Melis, it means honey. And palino is dust or particles. 
and I would say maybe it also means um, pollen. And logi is the study of. So there you have your whole your education in one word. This is a more scientific way to look at honey, and that's fascinating to me. Um, you can study pollen grain. And I'm thinking, okay, where well, we study pollen grain. Well, look, the, the picture or the drawing on the left here, you see the dandelion pollen grain and the manuka and the clover. You see how different they are? So you cannot, you can see in our honey, if we do this, um, if we study those honey under a compound microscope, you can see the pollen this way. So you know what your honey really is. It's either dandelion, clover, a mix, et cetera, et cetera, because those pollen grain, this is like uh, their DNA. You cannot change that. You cannot add them. You cannot remove them. This is what it is in the honey. So the source of pollen, it's also remember the geographical location and the genius of the plant. So this, I feel like this uh, study, this uh, melisa, melisopalinology is very important to combat fraud because you cannot make up a dandelion uh, pollen grain, impossible, okay? We've got few labs in the US that can test actually your honey. We have a uh, University of Arizona has one, University of Texas, Texas uh, A&M, University of Nebraska, where I have a friend there and they do test um, honey and they can see exactly uh, where the honey it, it comes from. It's expensive. So I guess it's not um, for everybody, but. We have, we have tools to see where her, the honey comes from. So preservation, this is, this is a great property of honey um, because uh, honey can be preserved for a very, very long time if, if you keep it out of humidity, you keep it in a cupboard and the dark place, um, the honey will, will not ferment if it's preserved properly. Remember 18.6 or lower. In fact, uh, the, some archeologists uh, discovered a 3,300 uh, year old jar of honey in uh, tombs, in Egyptian tombs. And then they opened it and they tasted it and they measured it. And they said that it was an absolutely remarkable condition because this honey had been in tomb, you know, so long ago, but kept in a dark place without, you know, being contaminated by the air or dust or anything. So I don't know, I'm going to conserve my honey for 3000 years, but at least we know that it's a, a property that's unique to the, the, to the honey because remember that the high sugar content prevents the fermentation, okay? So the key to control is to limit the humidity and the high level of sugar content. I want you to keep your honey in a dry cupboard in the pantry, and please don't put it in the fridge. It does not belong there. Uh, however, obviously honey may crystallize over time. Doesn't mean it goes bad when it crystallizes. What you have to do, if you don't like the crystallization, you just have to reheat it. How? I told you before, very low temperature, double boiler, and you do it very, very gently, okay? Do that that, that way, double boiler, it's, it's great, and um, you co it comes back to being uh, liquid honey. Any question on that? Okay, we are going to talk about the medical usage of- Can you wait? Um, oh. There's a question um, about, um, is there a pollen color chart for West Coast plants? Um, all the ones I have found online are East Coast based. I do not know any of that. Wendy, do you have a- Yeah, I can, I can get an answer for you, Christine, not a problem. Okay. And then there's another one. Is the P fund an abbreviated name? Curious as to what the P fund represents. It's a person that did that, uh, co the color scale. Okay. So that's a name. It's a last name. 
All right, that's all that's in the chat. Okay. So medical usage of honey, we're still on the honey topic here. So uh, usually it's, uh, it's used orally or topically for uh, ulcers and wounds and burns, okay? Because it has antiseptic and antibacterial property properties. And 5,000 years ago, obviously traditional Chinese medicine, they use that. It's written, they have you know, books uh, talking about this. Um, even in India and Sri Lanka, um, honey was applied to heal sores. Um, during the third century, a Greek philosopher Celsius used a mix of bran and honey to make a paste to heal burns. And this is all um, written. It's uh, something that we know about. Today, it's used in hospital actually to treat drug resistant strain of bacteria. For instance, the MSR, they use, uh, usually they use a manuka honey from New Zealand. Um, I remember my mom uh, was a nurse and she was working in the children's hospital in the burn, burning unit. So kids that were coming with huge burns and at the time they were using bandages that they themselves dipped in honey and uh, wrapped um, the kids, you know, into the, the honey. And it was, apparently it was a miracle. I mean, those um, burned um, scars uh, would, uh, would heal and uh, the skin would be better than when anything else they had at the time. So mead, this is, this is important. It's the oldest alcoholic beverage in the world. It's produced by fermenting honey and water. And then you can add other um, flavor or additive like fruits or spices or grains or hops, etc. Actually, we have a um, introduction to meat Saturday, May 7th, if you want to write down your calendar. So May 7th, 2022, and it uh, will be um, taught by Mark Carlson, who is a, also a um, master beekeeper, an avid mead maker, and a camp volunteer. And he owed me some mead. He told me that I would have to taste his because he makes some as well. So don't miss this class. I think it's going to be a great class Saturday, May 7th, 2022 on Zoom. So please sign up for that. Beeswax. I love this picture. I think it's pretty with all those different uh, sizes of candles. Um, that's another product of the hive, obviously you know about. And it's mostly used by men from the Apis mellifera and the Apis serenae. Those are the two most uh, bred bees in the world. So this, those are the big producers of beeswax. The beeswax is only produced in liquid form by the workers. And who are the workers? Yes, they are the females. They have four special glands on their side, their, um, their thorax, and they produce small, clear white cells that you can see here on the picture on the right. You see this little um, abdomen there. And you can see the little, uh, little flakes. So right after being contacted with the air, it becomes whitish like this. Okay, otherwise it's and, and, and rigid. Otherwise it's uh, liquidy. Then you have the police and the police, the pollen and the propolis, and then it becomes yellowish and turn brown. The wax in about four, four years because it contains a lot of uh, residues like cocoons and other impurities. See the picture on the left. This is when this is the pristine wax when the bees collected. You know the the wax from their abdomen and then they um, fabricate those little cells, a little comb. You can see that usually when um, you put the honey super and it's brand new, you're, you're on the foundation and you can see this beautiful wax. This is um, premium wax. You can do a lot of beautiful things with it, uh, cosmetic and things of that nature. Very prized, highly prized. So what happened is the bees, they, they mold the wax with their mouth part, and then they make the, look at the combs, you guys, the cells. It's exactly six-sided comb cells. They all equal, they all the same, they're perfect. And then somebody's gonna ask me why this is hexagonal, right? Well, because 
in mathematics is the most efficient using the minimum amount of wax to hold a maximum of honey. So this, they are engineers, those little things, those little, this, those little insects. We don't know how to do this ourselves. We need some rulers and this and those tools to make sure that our hexagon will be, you know, perfect. They don't need all that. They can do it by themselves. Did you know that we need about a thousand one hundred scales to make one gram of wax, and one gram of wax because I did not know, but it's zero point zero thirty five ounces. So this is takes a lot of work. It has been uh, estimated that bees collectively fly about 150,000 miles. So that's about six times around the earth to yield only one pound of wax. So a lot of work to uh, create or fabricate a pound of wax. So use it judiciously. They do that for you or them first, but you know, we use it. So if you look at those beautiful pictures here. Um, we can see the uh, on the picture on the left, upper upper left, the little uh, wax scales. So as soon as they are out like this, the air um, they are in, in contact with air and they become just little flat like this. Sometimes, if you look on your bottom board when you decide to clean your bottom board, because you should do that once in a while, right? You can see those little flecks, the little 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 pieces of wax like this. When they fall on the on the bottom board, they never pick it up again to use it. Very interesting. But um, when bees have used all the cells in the comb, the nectar stays in their their honey stomach, the crop. So this stores sugar for them, uh, enable them to secrete small, small, small transparent plates through the glands in the front of their abdomen. You see, and the wax is then moved. To, by their legs to their mouth part, they chew and chew and chew, they add a little bit of enzymes, and then it's really uh, ready to use. You see the hanging curtain of bees that passes the material up the chain. It's called the builder bees, and they build their comb like this. So they pass the wax like that, and they make, um, they make their uh, foundation like this if you don't have a uh, plastic foundation for them to use. As I said, bees wax combs get darker and darker because the bees, see this one is kind of yellowish because the bees walk on it. They rear the young, they pull their, they put honey pollen in them. So there's a lot of debris. So I know that it's expensive, but we have to remember that it's recommended to change about 20% of your brood, brood foundation annually to decrease the disease and pesticide contamination because wax attracts a lot of that. It stays in, in the wax, the, 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 the viruses and the pesticides contamination stays inside the wax. So if you would change, you know, few of your foundation every year, that would be helpful for the health of your honeybees actually. Any questions? Too bad you cannot smell the beeswax right now. You'll come back to classroom, we'll, we'll do that. So the wax in the medieval Europe, that's about, we're talking about the fifth centuries, okay? Everybody on this panel, we were all farmers and very poor. Maybe just Wendy, she was, you know, living in a castle and she was a queen. So let's say that's the case. It can be said that honey was a byproduct of the wax at this, at this juncture because in England, at the time, wax was worth about eight times, eight times as much as honey. And why is that? Well, because it provided the most prized means of lighting after dark. What were we doing? Like us, little pauper. We would not go and read before going to bed, right? It was dark. Okay, boom, in bed we go. And then you wake up the next morning. But people who had money, because it was very expensive, it was just, you know, available for the upper class, the bourgeoisie, the landlords, the monarchs, and the clergy. They could afford pure beeswax candle. Okay, so that was a big difference between the upper class and us, the little farmers. But that's okay. So the qualities, qualities of pure beeswax. 
Well, beeswax is an attractive product. And why is that? Why do we like real beeswax candle? Because it's natural, but also because it has a pleasant aroma, a good fragrance, and it burns very, very slowly and cleanly. Okay, doesn't you don't have that dark soot, you know, that you can see everywhere. Um, those quality makes the wax useful in candle making and also uh, polishing wax. Beeswax can only be obtained or made by honeybee. As much as we are smart here, human beings, we cannot make wax either, okay? This is something very special that the honeybees, they don't share their little secrets with us. So very important, beeswax. So this is the candles of the peasants, the candles for me, okay? What did we use a long, long, long time ago? They were the cheapest candle and they were made with reeds, you know, usually picked um, early summer. So they were young and juicy. And we stripped the we stripped the little reed to just one single layer covering the pith. That was very important. And then we dipped those little, little piece of reeds in melted animal fat. Yes, fat, because this is was cheap, right? So usually it was sheep or beef or pig. And those were called tallow. Okay. So those are the little candle and they do not burn cleanly at all. It's all um, dark and lots of smoke, not fun. We did experiment in classrooms. So if you come in the class, we'll do that. Very interesting. So like I said, wax is very special and very complex. It's a, when you analyze it, it's a mixture of more than 300 compounds. So how in the world can we make this? We cannot. Right, the composition of bees wax varies, of course, among different families of bees, different breeds of bees, probably related to genetic and diet. This is what the, the uh, scientists think. The production of beeswax in the United States is about one to two pounds of beeswax per 100 pounds of honey collected or produced. So it takes a lot of honey, capped honey, you see here on the left, that's capped honey. So you remove the, the, the wax cappings right there and you render this on the right, it's been clean. In water, you remove the most of uh, the, the honey and then you melt it. So yeah, uh, two pounds per 100 pounds, this is, uh, this is why it's expensive, okay? So how do you do that? Like I told you, mankind has not be able to produce or reproduce beeswax beside all the technologies and advancement in the world. We cannot do this exactly like the honeybees, impossible. So how do we collect the wax? Well, like you see, we remove a very, very fine um, um, layer of wax from the comb and this comb is full of honey. So you're gonna extract your honey. So every time you extract your honey, this please do not trash this wax. It's the best wax. It, it um, really, you can sell it for a good price. So you melt your wax. Okay, we do that again in a double boiler. You see here, and you see the little impurities that are dropping on the bottom of it. So all those little wings and little speck of dust and whatever they bring to the hive, it's right at the bottom of your pan. So you have, a, after that, when it's liquidy like this, you have to pass it through a sieve to remove all those. Usually we pour it in a container like a milk or orange carton like this. And then you make, you make it, um, you, it stays on the countertop for a little bit. It hardens and then you have blocks like this. And then you can use it to do whatever you want with it. Um, when we, we do that, when we do the in-person in class, we try to do that to show how fun it is. And it smells so good. I mean, just beautiful. Um, too bad I cannot share with you the, the aroma. So the best quality wax, who are, which are they? They are from the wax cappings from the honey, okay? You fill the combs before extracting the liquid honey. The best quality wax is not the wax that are used for the nests, okay? For good reason, now that you know how to and all your honeybees because the, the brood nest, what do they have? We always have brood, we always have to clean them. We have wings, they walk on it a lot, uh, they bring debris and it's not pure, okay? 
So if you do anything with wax, please use the one um, that you just uh, extracted your honey. This is the best wax to do all of your cosmetic. Um, it melts beautifully and uh, you can do a lot of different things with it. If you want to, because some people say, well, you know, I'm gonna trash some of my, um, my combs from the nest and you know it's very sad that I'm trashing all the uh, wax. It is true. So what you can do is you do another another pot a double boiler, you melt that wax, okay? So the darker wax. And what you can do, um, we did that in Minnesota in, and, and in the lab we did we did that we uh, with a brush we were brushing the um, our uh, frames or our our foundation to attract the honeybees. So that's okay, but don't use it. Um, for your supers where the, the nectar it's going to be collected and becoming honey, but you can use absolutely that wax, okay? So wax candles are not the same as bees wax candle. You see this little happy birthday one? It is not the same. Um, almost half of the big wa bees wax in the world comes from Africa. And why is that? It's because they get their honey and then they have to, to get their honey, they have to crush all the new, new made wax every season because they don't, uh, most of the African nations, they do not have honeybees in a uh, regular beehive that we know, the length froth. Um, it's different techniques. And um, so that's why they crush every year or every season rather, they crush their um, wax foundation and everything and to extract their honey. And so they have the wax right there sitting. Well, that's another product they can sell and they sell that at a very uh, premium uh, price, which is wonderful. So beeswax is gaining importance because um, it has only been studied recently, but it's a positive outcome uh, coming from beeswax is the synergy with honey. Olive oil is very effective apparently for the atopic dermatis and psoriasis and diaper rash. So there's papers and there's research on this and you can find those uh, papers uh, saying that those two uh, beautiful ingredient, honey uh, and olive oil and beeswax mixed together, very, very effective. So um, it's been studied and it's great. And I think it makes sense when you think about it. So I think we have also, those are things that you can make with bees, beeswax. Um, we have hand lotion, furniture polish. Oh, this is so great. And then candles. Just a little little story before I take a little break. Um, furniture polish. My my grandmother, when we live in France, my grandmother would polish her all her wooden furniture that was, you know, like two centuries old, whatever. And uh, every year it smells so good. She was polishing all those things one by one, and the whole house smelled like. Um, beeswax candle thing. And I'm like, to this day when we extract and when we do that, this is, uh, this is the picture I have. It's my grandmother with her little uh, cotton cloth, you know, going around the house and, and polishing her uh, furniture, which was also a great preservative also of wood. So with that, we're gonna take a little break. We can take questions before you go in a break and um, we we'll come back, uh, come back in 15 minutes or so. There are a couple of questions in the chat. Uh, besides Apis mellifera, what's the other type of bee that produces wax? The one that it's in Africa. That's the bees that, that uh, are good producers of it. But here we here in the US, we have Apis mellifera. Mm -hmm. so this is where our wax comes from. And would it be possible to reuse the beeswax candle wax to make more candles? Yeah. I think it's a good thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, terrific. So it's 10.05 right now. Let's uh, press the pause button and come, well, it's 10.06. Let's come back at 10.16, shall we? We'll take a 10 minute break. Thank you. We're back. All right. Okay, everybody sees that slide, pollen? Yeah. I love this. Uh... This slide, uh, Wendy was commenting on the honeybee on the right here. You can see those little, I mean, unbelievable, <laughs> this, those little grains of pollen all over the bee. And uh, she's gonna come back to the hive and her sisters are gonna clean her up, take all, every little piece and um, 
just pack them into the cell. So wonderful. And on the left is a little jar with a lot of little um, pollen grain that you can use in your salad or whatever you want to do. So let's talk about pollen because it's another product of the hive. Sometimes it's overlooked, but we're gonna go through and, and see what it's all about. Maybe I can move my slide, that would be great. Here we go. So pollen. So what is it? First of all, the definition of, of pollen is the male germ cell of the anthers of different plants. And the pollen is the principal source of protein. If you do not remember anything from this lecture, pollen, it's protein, P and P, okay, simple. The average colony size is about, let's say 20,000 bees and they can collect up to a hundred, in average, 125 pounds of pollen per year. So that's very significant. Here we can see those, uh, this is a great picture where the bees are just lined up, bee line, right? And they are going back home, back to their entrance, back to the hive with their uh, legs full of pollen. You can see them. Some are a little lazy, like the third one over there. I don't know, she doesn't have a whole lot of pollen, but she's coming back to the hive, so which is very important. So honeybees actually collect uh, pollens on their leg baskets and it's called corbiculae. So they have two, so corbiculae. If they had only one, it would be corbicula. So they packed loads and loads of them, um, of, uh, of uh, pollen and those little grain of, those little, those little packing thing, it's about 100 to 200 milligrams of pollen. And this load is about one and a half <laughs> the weight of their own little bodies. So I don't know, I cannot carry that myself. It's an excellent source of protein. They have amino acids in there, fatty substances, minerals, and vitamin for larvae as well as for bees. It helps the bees with the production of the royal jelly. They also make bee bread. The bee bread, it's a fermented pollen and bees stay, stay longer and live longer when they eat good source of pollen. If pollen is contaminated with pesticide, well, the bees would could and will perish or they will starve to death actually. So we are making sure around us, you know, we need to know what's uh, applied around us, around our beehives to make sure that the pollen that they collect is um, as clean as possible. They cannot detect if it is uh, with pesticides, laced with pesticide. So this is a comb in the hive, okay? This is using a top bar. So you don't, it's, there's no frame, right? So this is, what you should see when you open your hive and you look into a frame, you could see uh, the cap honey on top, and then you see some uh, brood in the middle, caps brood, the flat uh, tan color cells. You see pollen right beside it, a little colorful. This is where they pack uh, the pollen in those little cells that are very close to the brood, okay? And then you see on the left here, we see a uh, cap drone brood indicated. So there's little, uh, little ball, a little bumpy, a little rounder. And this is the difference between the drone and the workers because the drones are a little bigger. Uh, so you can make a difference. They look like little bullets. So look at that. This is the pollen when it's packing cells. This is wonderful. Look at those little layers. The foragers drop those pellets near the uncapped larvae, like I just said, because this is the food. They need that close, close, close by. Then the house bees, they will pack down the pellet and they do that. And you can see that when you look at your, at your frame, they have their little heads and their little, I don't call them the little arms, but anyway, the little front legs and they, they pack it, you know, they, 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 it looks like they are boxing, you know, they're, they're just moving their little legs and they're pushing with their heads to make sure that they're all flat. And, you know, a lot of uh, pieces of pollen um, are packed in one cell. Um, we counted those because we had nothing to do one day um, <laughs> in Marla's lab, and we decided to count the little, the little, uh, you know, strata of, of pollen, and it's 18. So um, it's about, uh, it needs about 18 loads of pollen to fill one little teeny cell like this. So there's a lot of work. Pollen that's like this does not germinate because the bees actually mix it um, the content of the 
the pollen with the content of their honey stomach, the crop. So you remember in their, in their crop, they have a lot of enzymes and things of that nature, beneficial bacteria. So it's all mixed with the pollen pellets, then packed into the cell. And this is gonna be kind of untombed for, for a long time, will not germinate. You cannot take a cell like this, put it in the soil, it will not grow, nothing. Nothing is gonna happen, okay? But when they do that, so when they do uh, add the enzyme and the beneficial um, bacteria in there, it is called now bee bread, okay? And this is a very complex nutritious food for all bees, very, very important um, food item for them. And here, look at this beautiful thing, multicolor pollen. The pollen is stored for many, many months at the time. I remember like uh, in Nebraska or in Minnesota, we have long, long, long winters. So the, the pollen has to stay uh, fresh and edible for, for a long period of time. The bees top off the cell with a little bit of honey when it's kind of almost full to the brim. And then they cap it with a very thin layer of, of wax. And this is how it's all encapsulated. It's done, it's, little, it's a little container. And the bees increase their consumption of pollen and bee bread. And you know when? It's in the fall. So all springtime and sometimes in the summer, depending where you live, they bring a lot of pollen, then it stops, but they need to, they need to collect that for the winter. So if you don't see any pollen coming into your hive, you have a little problem. So trapping pollen. First of all, why in the world do we want to do that ourselves, right? Well. There's a few things. We can study the characteristics of the uh, pollen. We can and that identify flowers. We can also add it to our human uh, diet or the pet diets uh, that happens. You can feed your bees. Let's say you don't have any fresh pollen coming in. Well, you have a little reserve that you put in your freezer. You can uh, give them that as well. Uh, either in la late winter or at the beginning of spring when there's nothing uh, flowering or when it's raining a lot. Not that it's raining a lot in Southern California, but in some places in the world, it, it rains a lot. And um, it's helpful to have a little stash of, uh, of pollen. You, have, you can also determine if the pollen is contaminated with pesticide and that's what's very important. And you also know the origin of the honey because you know the provenance of your honey if you know where the pollen has been collected. So those are important factors. So how do you trap pollen? Oh, look, you have a little device. It's called, ta-da, a pollen trap, you people, you see? It's a little uh, kind of a screen. The bees have to pass through those little holes in the trap and you, I don't know if you can see, but if you put your nose to your uh, computer here your screen, you can see the, those little um, little pellets that are on the on their legs. Well, it's scraped every time they come through those little blue holes. There, the pollen is scraped down and scraped from there. So they come in and they have nothing to clean up. They have nothing to for the hive actually. Okay, um, and the pollen. What happened? You have a little tray underneath, and the pollen falls into this little tray and then you can collect it. You see that? That's a lot. That's a lot of, uh, of pollen. I suggest that you should not have your traps on, on all the time for your hive and this, why? Because the bees need to collect also some uh, pollen for themselves to stay healthy. If you collect too much, your bees are gonna be unhealthy and they, and they will perish. So you have to be very careful what you're doing with um, this pollen trap. Uh, remember, this is uh, the pollen is their source of protein to grow and develop. If they don't have uh, pollen, actually, you can see that um, you would you would you would observe that your larvae and your bees are either deform or very small. Um, remember something too. It's like for our food, all pollens are not equal. So bees need a mix of healthy to be a healthy. Uh, they need a mix of pollens, just like us. Okay, this is why we have colorful pollen. You know, we have pink, blue. I mean, you can observe, we try to observe it every time we go in our and um, visit our apiary. The first thing we look, it's in the front. We, sit there, we, we, we stay there for a little bit, two, three minutes, and we look 
what uh, color pollen do the bees bring? And sometimes we are very surprised because I'm very happy to see sometime last week, I think we saw a bluish uh, pollen coming in one of our, our hives. So um, that was, it's always fun, you know, it's always, oh my gosh, this is great. And um, anyway, so it's important for you to observe your bees. And this is one thing you can really observe, especially right now, as they are gathering a lot of pollen in um, Southern California. And then <clears throat> this is colorful pollen right here, okay? I love this picture. And those are about the size of grain of sand, you know, uh, a little bit bigger. It's, uh, it's pretty, and it's dry. This is, you can take it in your hand. I mean, it, it, it won't melt or anything like that. You can see it's, uh, it's something that you could yourself use, you know? Uh, if you're allergic, please don't do that. Don't take a uh, tablespoon of it. Uh, you're gonna have big allergy explosion and uh, this is not good, but you can use it. So propolis, what is propolis? Well, I'm sure some of you have noticed that sometimes when you go for, to open uh, your hive and you're using your hive tool that you did not lost, right? Because you know, you're very careful about where you put your tools, right, Jason? So. What happened is you have to really scrape, you know, the, 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 between the frames and it's like complicated, it, it cracks open every time. It's because they put this kind of glue. You see the picture here? And this is a sticky gum. It's really sticky. It comes from the trees and the flower buds. And it's really used for, the bees use that as a glue to put everywhere. They don't like having cracks in their, the, in their houses or their nest so they will uh, use that um, like a cement and they, they will block all the little holes and crannies that they have. Um, we also observe even here in Southern California which I was uh, pretty surprised but they also we use um, um, inner covers and then in our inner covers we have a little hole for air circulation and whatnot and sometimes we will see that the hole is almost almost closed maybe a couple of bees can go through uh, but that's it. And um, this is their way of saying, hey, we want to be warm and, and, and dark where we are. And we don't laugh. We don't like to have uh, air drafts coming in, just like us. We don't like to have drafty houses. It's also, there's a special, pro special properties for the propolis. It's anti antibacterial and antifungal for the bees, but it's also for us. So for the honey bees, it's very important. And that for us also, we can use it um, for, uh, for our own purposes. I'm gonna show you some example of propolis that we can um, actually look. So studies have shown that the propolis may restrict, for instance, bacterial plaque development, you know, the plaque development in your teeth because it is antibacterial and antioxidant properties. So we can have a toothpaste, uh, toothpaste with propolis, I don't know about that. I like my little toothpaste uh, minty and not propolisy, I think. But uh, well, it's something we can we can maybe try. It would be nice to yeah. When we have a class, we should try this. Um, otherwise, there's tinctures that uh, you can even buy or you can make. Uh, it's a little um, form, liquidy form. And here I was was uh, when I was ta talking about you know trying to make very small the holes smaller. Like this is an entrance. And the uh, bees decided to really close up, you know, the entrance, uh, putting propolis. Pro propolis will, here it's not soft anymore, it's hardened. So this is why when we come with our, um, to open a uh, hive, uh, we put our um, hive tool, we can hear crack, crack, and we can see the little pieces of uh, propolis. Actually, we could, had a, a few, an old beekeeper that was one of my friends, he was, uh, he, no, he passed away, I guess, but he was 90 years old. And uh, what he was doing, and he had been keeping bees for, I don't know, 60 years or something. And uh, while well, he was cracking his thing, and then he was eating the propolis that was falling on the, on the grass. And I was like, what are you doing? And he said, oh, it's good for my gums. I, I enjoy chewing on this. So he was just taking it right from the hive. So, um, and he lived for a long, long time. So probably that helped. Royal jelly, look at this beautiful picture. We see the bees there um, inside the little cell. You have, you can see a lot of uh, royal jelly. Royal jelly is 
uh, very viscous and it's whitish like this. And that's very important when you open your, um, your hive and you look at the frame of brood, you should see in your cells, you should see a lot of, um, you should see a lot of royal jelly, okay? If it's dry, if you, sell, if you see your cell, most of your cells are dry, meaning that you don't see a lot of um, liquid, if you will, in those cells, it's because it, they have, a, they, the bees lack um, protein. So if you want to help them, you can give them a little pollen patties that would help. And that happens sometimes when you have a new package because there's not a lot of foragers going out and getting um, the pollen. So it's always nice to give them a little bit of pollen patty a supplement to help them along. Um, you will see that if they don't um, eat your pollen, the little piece of pollen patty that you give, well, that means that they're fine. They will not consume it if they don't eat, need it. So just be aware of this. Lots of royal jelly in cells. It's very important for the development of um, the uh, larvae. So it's a viscous substance, like I said, and this is secreted by the uh, apopharyngeal and mandibular glands of nurse bees, okay? This is developed in their heads. I think you're gonna learn that in their journey level. It's absolutely fascinating. This is another, another, another item that we cannot make. We cannot produce this. Um, very important for the honeybees. It is essential food, okay, for the larvae and the queen bee. Remember, she floats in that. She needs to, and after that, when she is an adult, that's all she eats. So we need to have royal jelly around. And what it does, the royal jelly, it does transform a regular egg. So you take any eggs into a queen bee, okay? It's also extending the lifespan of that huh, miraculous bee that is eating this from six weeks about to five years. So it's something that in the royal jelly, you know, all those components of uh, uh, vitamin D, vitamin B, and the proteins and the amino acid and the collagen makes that um, make it that uh, it, it it expand the lifespan of the queen bee. And it also comes in the premium price because of all these essential uh, minerals. Okay, and uh, so when we collect uh, royal jelly, for instance, you can get a fairly good good price. So let's look at the extraction of, um, of royal jelly. Not that I encourage people to do that, but you need to know about this. So it's called the, I call it, I call it the royal factory extraction. Okay, this is not a real term. This is my little take on it. So you have a, for people who don't know what that is, it is um, when we make a queen. So those are two bars of um, a queen. So we have the little queen cups, they're called. Those are plastic, a blue and yellow, blue and yellow. Those are little plastic containers, if you will, that we put on the bar, on one of the top bar. And then we extract um, a, a larvae that is um, less than two days old. And we put it in there and we are just putting them in those little um, receptacles, those, those little cups and the honeybees. We put all those bars into a colony where the honeybees will construct a, all the, the, the little, the little uh, what is it called? The little cell for the, for the queen. You can see they are elongated and they're rough on the outside. So all of those are possible queens, okay? So they are all in those bars. Um, they are um, alive. And what do they eat? They eat the royal jelly that has been uh, put inside those cells, okay? So it takes about 14 days, right, to, uh, to have a queen or to, for the queen to hatch. So in the meantime, you have your little factory going. So what you can do to extract the, um, the royal jelly, because that's the best, and you have a lot in those cells, right, compared to the drone cells or to the worker cells, you will have way more uh, royal jelly, right? Because first of all, the shape and it's elongated, it's longer than the regular cell. So what you do is with a sharp knife, you cut the end of those little cells there and um, you uh, extract the, uh, the queen. And uh, you, and then you take a little, uh, a little spoon, a teeny spoon, or you know, up, uh, something, a little wooden stick, and you remove all the royal jelly one by one, and you put directly in a jar. And that's the natural, unprocessed form of getting royal jelly. 
Well, you know what happened with the queens, right? They are not livable, they're, they're dead. So all you're doing is you are removing the royal jelly and you're killing all those queens. I do not do that. I don't like to do that. I've never done this, but you can try to see um, if you are interested. So today I know that the pure royal jelly, for instance, in France, I mean, they do you know beautiful cosmetic over there and it costs about 80 to $100 per ounce of uh, fresh, natural extracted royal jelly okay so very very expensive and this is why probably why your creams and all that for your face and make you beautiful cost a lot of money but look this is how it can be sold too it can be capsules so you can eat it yourself okay i know that in new zealand they do that and also some uh, cream hand creams uh face creams uh, they can, they also have a portion of royal jelly in it. So uh, to be sure that you have actually royal jelly, just read the label, okay? Because you don't want to pay for something that's not real. So as you can say, honey, pollen, propolis, and royal jelly have different um, distinct efficacies with uh, significant nutritional uh, properties and functional values. That means that all of the products that we've talked about have been developed further for um, epitherapeutic agents. Okay, so that means that you have to be very careful when you take all those bee products because in case you are allergic and if you don't know. So before you do any of that, you need to make sure that you're not allergic to any of those uh, products. There's an article called and it's here, this is the, the website, uh, Honey, Propolis and Royal Jelly, a comprehensive review of the biological action and health benefits. This is an article uh, written in 2017, very, very informative about um, the different product uh, of the hive. So um, I think I know that um, Wendy would probably put it also in, her, in the notes. So do we have any question on all those beautiful products before we go on? Yes, <clears throat> you have some questions. Um, so uh, I think there's only one. Would you consider crushing fresh pollen and coating the commercial pollen patties in, a, in the winter when there is little fresh pollen available as a way to stretch the protein source for, for the bees? Well, you could do that, but I would say, well, why don't you leave it in the hive? You don't need to interfere. I think as a, as a beekeeper, we can leave it in the hive. I would do that only if I need to save another colony, right? Does that answer the question? Okay, that's the only question we had. Okay, perfect. Well, we are going to talk about another topic and this is epitherapy. So by now you know your Latin, right? So therapy with epi bees. So let's see that. First, we have a disclaimer that I will read out loud. What will follow is only for your information, not advice. Camp does not claim to advocate the usage of any product from the hive. You should always consult a doctor or other appropriate medical professionals before starting a new, any new therapy or alternative medicine. Okay, that's very important. Don't go and eat all your pollen in your hive, please. That's all I have to say. So there's a very um, uh, worldwide definition. This is um, the definition is the medical use of products of the honeybee hives. Okay, often used with essential oils. So this is what epitherapy is. And the, the philosophy behind it is, it's a form of harmony between the individual and the environment. So we always want to be in balance. And this is the philosophy behind it. So let's look at the uh, epiary origins. Well, there's a, the oldest documents is from Mesopotamia. It was wrote, written uh, onto wax tablet and it was found around uh, 2700 BC. And it was stating that the honey was a medication, a medication and not 
a food, okay? It was used medically. In ancient Egypt, in Greece and in China, the use of honey bee products, all of them, they were healing properties traced back to thousand years ago. Um, at the time, the benefits of consuming bee products was said to help, you know, um, the eyes, intestine, kidneys, and circulatory problems. I have a little story. I always have stories, but my daughter, um, Julie, she was in a Peace Corps for three years and she was in Senegal and she was riding back home and she was saying that people in her village, uh, they have a lot of, you know, diseases because the, the way they live, etc. but for conjunctivity, so uh, what's it called? Pink eye, they would, uh, at night, they would clean the kid, they would clean the face or the adult, whatever, uh, with water. And then they would put a, a little bit of honey directly in the eye and put some gauze on the eyes and you had, she observed it on a child. And she, the kid had go, go to bed that, like, this, that, like this with the little gauze on, on, his, uh, on his little eyes. And then in the morning, the mom would remove those little gauze crush them, and then um, slowly the, the the pink eye would, would go away. And Julie, I mean, she observed that and she relayed that to me because she knew I was talking about this in my classes and I thought, wow, this is, uh, this is amazing. Well, we don't do that anymore, right? We go to the eye doctor, I guess. But it's just to show that um, I think sometimes we, we, we lost um, you know, knowledge that we had or we used something maybe quote unquote better. So the epitherapy evolution, well, it happens, um, you know, a little while ago, obviously, there was a, a professor, Dr. Philip Tresch, um, he was an Austrian, and he wrote an article that was at, at the time kind of um, revolutionary. Uh, he, it was an article in, in which he said, quote, report about peculiar connection between the bee stings and rheumatism was important, and this was in 1888. He was already using it in his, in his private practice for helping people who had um, rheumatism, okay? We had no idea why it worked. He did not either, but uh, this claim were never tested at that time in the proper clinical trials. Um, but he's uh, considered the uh, father of epitherapy long time after that. Um, we have something that's clear and has been uh, in clinical trials is the venom therapy, but that came way later, okay? And in this country, we call it VT, venom therapy. We have another person that's pretty important to the epitherapy world, he's called, he's called Dr. Beck. And this person was a, really a product of Central Europe in the late 19th century, just like, you know, Sigmund Freud. So he was a part of this group of, of newcomers with new ideas. And he came to the US after the First War, the First World War, and he established a, a traveling Park Avenue practice among the elite of New York Upper East Side. And he treated in his own house thousands and thousands of patients with many diverse medical conditions. And for him, because he, you know, he learned in Europe, epitherapy was another tool for a doctor that he could use to help his patient. So he used the modern um, uh, tool and he used also in his practice, um, the epitherapy. His whole life he tried, may try, they tried, and he tried to have the, the B venom therapy, for instance, recognized by the medical profession, but without success. He died in 1942, and it, uh, it was not uh, something that the uh, American uh, government, I guess, wanted to know about. <laughs> so it was never on. But um, some people persisted, and uh, the bee venom in the US came along uh, with Charles Mars. He's an American, and he was a beekeeper in Vermont for more than 60 years. He's right here on this little lab here on the right. And he was the most distinguished beekeeper of our country for his advances in commercial beekeeping and also venom therapy. He wrote a book <laughs> in his later years. He was 93 years old when he wrote it and um, it's called Health and the Honeybee. It's still available because I checked. So you can still buy it. 
Um, and this uh, gentleman uh, was lucky enough to work with Dr. Beck in 1935 because uh, Charles Mars was really, really intrigued by bee venom. So he was recognized in the United States as a the pioneer of the bee venom therapy. And here for abbreviation, they call, you know, you see that in articles sometimes, it's called BVT. So the use of bee stings to treat various disorders, uh, primarily, primarily, obviously, it's the autoimmune diseases they did research. He did clinical research with scientific scientists at the Sloan Kettering Institute and also the Walter Reed Army Institute of Research. So everything he did for the venom therapy was backed, backed up by um, trials and facts and uh, good research. He also established a standard of purity for dried whole venom for the US Food and Drug Administration. And he himself, he was the supplier of venom to pharmaceutical companies throughout the world, throughout his whole life. So he was the only one who did that for a long, long time. Very interesting uh, biography when you read about him. So let's talk a little bit about the rediscovery of healing. And then this is through the, high, the eyes of epitherapy. So in 1950s, I was not born yet, but it was coming along. The world price of honey crashed because it was an oversupply in the market. In the meantime, well, we had the alternative health market that was growing. Pollen, propolis, royal jelly, venom therapy, all this began to appear, you know, in health stores, talking about it, reading about it. And the new trend of all of this together was called epitherapy. It really took off in the 1990 as an alternative medicine, or if you will, a return to traditional uh, medicine. Remember, we need a lot of laboratory results to be legit in our countries. And right now the remedies are just folk medicine. Although this happened in Europe, it always been there. We never had problems. In America, we need a lot of uh, labs results to be approved, okay? So this is where West meets East. So before, about, before talking about the benefit of epitherapy, I think we need to take a look at um, different philosophies regarding sickness between the Western and the Eastern world, because we see things differently and to approach it, we need to, 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 to know a little bit about it. So I'm gonna give you a very broad and very general view of those two philosophy. I think we can spend 6 million semesters on this, which would be fascinating, but right now we don't have that much time. So the Western world, as ours, we like to look at the smallest possible particle that is disease in our body, okay? And this concept follows the way of hypothetical deduction, and we use pathology, dissection, scans, analysis, I mean, lab tests, and so on. Okay, this is our world. We have a little, we look at the littlest boo-boo that we have, okay? We try to treat that. The Eastern world is a bit different approach, and is considered health as a balance. A balance states, versus a disease state, which is unbalanced. So this philosophy does not look at the smallest little thing that we have, the smallest entity, but to the larger conception or perceptions, I should say. It prefers to adapt to the environment, okay, instead of trying to change it. Thus the, epi the epitherapy looks at the human being as a whole instead of the Western vision, which is we're going to treat the little boo-boo, okay? This is very simple, but this is the big picture. And when you try, try to learn about it a little bit, a little bit more, it's, it's absolutely fascinating. So let's see, let's talk about, let's take a look at the bee venom and the FDA. So epitherapy is not, approved okay it's not an approved form of treatment in the united states but the bee venom therapy bvt has been approved by the fda for desensitization purpose only that has to be done first of all in um, doctor's offices okay and in the u.s epitherapy is considered both the legal and the medical point of view as experimental approach so it's not 
regulated by the FDA, not approved. So what is bee venom? Um, it's colorless. Look at the vials on the right. And it's acidic actually. It contains both anti-inflammatory and inflammatory compounds, okay? It contains also uh, some enzymes, minerals, sugars, and amino acid. And the main component and the major pain when you get stung is the militin. Okay, this is the honey bee venom, but it has some antiviral and antibacterial and anti-cancers properties. We've got, I have two articles here. Um, and those uh, are good articles to read. So, whoop, I will, this one, there we go, here we go. Bee venom therapy. I want to be very clear because only female honeybee produce it. You know why, right? Who stings? That's right, the drones don't sting. So it's the female. So female honeybee only produce the venom that we will need for the therapy. It's um, natural treatment. There's a lot of proponent of it. Uh, some researchers are conflicting or lacking. However, we uh, use it in traditional practices has been found for thousands or used for thousands of years. Now, this is not something we kind of one day woke up and say, okay, let's try this. We have, uh, like I said, there's some written uh, books and things about uh, the, um, the, benefits, the benefit of bee venom. The goal here is, um, as is, is important, the epitherapy, the clear view of this is the melody is the result of a break in the body and the spirit and the balance of the spirit. And this is important because this is why this, is a, this approach is different. The goal is to find the perfect balance in order to heal again, to be able to resist all the outside um, aggressions. So it's a very different philosophy. It's, it's completely different the way we think uh, when we use this kind of uh, therapy. So let's say, let's talk a bit about the benefits of the uh, of AP therapy. And, um, and those are all documented, okay? I'm not making it up just to have fun here. So it helps with the respiratory affliction, for instance, the, um, asthma uh, has been proven to be less intense you know, when you use a propolis, for instance. It helps, honey helps with the sinus, sinus infection and hay fever. It, for instance, eucalyptus and citrus honey are good cough suppressant for acute nighttime cough and for people with upper uh, respiratory infections. The digestive um, afflictions, honey has been used as a soft laxative, for instance, and pollen and honey also helps with constipation, if you want to know. It is effective as a part of the oral uh, dehydration therapy and pollen and propolis fight against ulcers, okay? And the, it's, it, it's a specific propolis from a specific honeybee they, it's the, that fights against ulcers, it's the Caucasian honeybee, okay? And then if you will, there's a podcast, uh, if you wanna listen to a, a podcast, um, it's the importance of propolis with doc, Dr. Marla Spivak from the University of Minnesota. Uh, she had done a little program here on January 21st, uh, 2021. It's about 45 minutes long. And she talks about um, all the um, importance of propolis and how we discover uh, new things. And she does, um, she did a lot of research and she still continues to do lots of research on propolis, which is um, probably will become something important in our lifetime. So the podcast, uh, I will, we will put that in the notes. So the remedicine, uh, the venom, remember it's anti-inflammatory property and that helps with the art, with arthritis. Um, just to let you know, Marla, she had some arthritis and she was doing that on herself. She was, right every time we were going into the apiary, I mean, I was a novice and she was grabbing some honeybees gently and she was just using that and, you know, 
poking herself and I was like, oh my gosh, this is terrible. She's going to be hurting so much. But no, she felt very good in her hand. And uh, she was telling us about the benefit for herself. I didn't say go guys do it, but it for her, it helped her with her arthritis. And um, I saw it firsthand and I thought, wow, that's, uh, that's amazing. Um, the propolis and the wax mixed together, when it's taken orally, it can help with uh, arthrosis. And the royal jelly also is known to help help with uh, osteoporosis in women. I don't know about men. I just read um, things about um, reports for in women. So the cardiovascular afflictions, remember uh, high blood pressure. So pollen apparently reduces uh, hypertension and this is uh, high blood pressure and honey uh, reduces also the risk of heart disease. Mix of uh, royal jelly pollen and propolis reduce the LDL cholesterol, and this is the bad cholesterol. Those have, uh, you have articles showing this, demonstrating that. So the skin afflictions, for instance, uh, psoriasis. It's very difficult to cure with even any modern medicine. For instance, the eczema. Um, and this is a quote from a, a report, and it says using propolis cream or natural, naturally from hive taken two or three times per day in com combination with royal jelly for three months, better the skin for um, around three or four weeks. I remember my son had, had eczema when he was little and uh, what we did, it's like, okay, well, the last resort, nothing was working. And it was absolutely, it was behind his legs, his knees. And I said, okay, well, that's it. We're gonna try to use um, some propolis cream and some honey. And um, we made a, with the doctor, we made a little concoction here. And um, Nicholas was going to bed when he was about four years old with little bandages around his knees with, um, with this concoction and uh, it cleared up. I mean, I don't know how it worked, but it just, um, it was fantastic. But I'm not saying it works. I'm just saying that's what happened with my son. So the healing of wounds, this is absolutely fascinating. Like the burns and the frostbites or chap skins. Uh, there's a French doctor, Bernard Descotte. He used honey, uh, which is antibacterial as a very, very simple technique. He, would, he just clean the wound, he add honey, he spread it, and then he covers it with a sterile the clean gauze and it was excellent wood, wound healing. And the scare, the scare, the scar, looks better. I have a story. I had my hives in Minnesota, in Eden Prairie. I had my hives in a, in a farm. And this um, family uh, not only had a couple of cows, but they also had a few horses. And one horse um, had hurt his leg crossing you know, from one pasture to the other. He scraped a nail and a um, big infection in his leg. The, the horse was about 15 years old. And the vet was coming all the time, every week to change the bandages and to change things. And he was not, you know, and giving some antibiotics and he was not um, getting better. So Liz, my friend who was, you know, where my hives were you know, on her pasture, she, she said, well, I learned about honey. Can we take some from your honey and try to make a concoction and, and try? And the vet said, well, we have nothing to lose. And uh, he tried that with the antibiotics on top, and uh, well, it healed the you know the the leg of the horse, and he never had. I mean, we could not see after. It took months to heal, but we we could not find after the hair grew grew back and all that. We could not find where the um, the scar was, and um, that's another thing. And uh, we decided actually to we use the honey that was on the property, but then we went and buy some manuka honey to do um, the little compound mixed for the horse. But this is just little things that I, you know, witnessed along the way. So for a uh, neurological affliction, this is brand new. Um, the epitherapy might, might offer some um, antidepressant and anti-convulsant and anti-anxiety benefits. Um, this has been kind of um, studied. Um, and there's uh, recent studies actually, it helps prevent memory disorder. This is brand new um, research. Um, it's not you know, common, but you will you be able to find some, um, some articles about that. Very fascinating. And I think they're kind of moving in a good direction. 
And this is the American Epitherapy Society, some information. And this is the best source of, of uh, information about medicinal use of bee product. Go on their website. They have, a, I mean, a ton of information. They have seminars, they have, um, they have classes. Um, it's, uh, it's a well done uh, thing. Then to uh, do this uh, PowerPoint presentation, I, I use many books. Uh, those are a few books um, that I use to do this. And also, obviously, I uh, went online and look for um, scientific articles to back up what I told you because I'm not making up stuff. Uh, do we have any questions on the presentation? And we'll have a chance also to, at the end, to ask some more questions. No, we're good, thank you. Perfect. So this is um, all photographs contained in this presentation have been sourced from private collections. And we have uh, two up upcoming May 2022 virtual classes. Um, we have uh, introduction to me that I talked to you about. Uh, that's Saturday, May 7th, 2022, uh, 9 a.m. to 12, and it's done by uh, Mark uh, Carlson, and uh, it's going to be fantastic. Please sign up. All those uh, posters I would like to add that have been made and produced, and this slide have been produced by Trish McAleer. She's a volunteer here at, um, at the BT MOC uh, in Irvine, and she does all our presentations. She put that in a nice package, so I kind of look good. I'm trying to look good with all the stuff that she made for us. So um, please sign up for this one or look into it. And then uh, we have also another one coming up, and this is May 21st, 9 to noon. It's um, Honey Bee Health, so it's everything about the diseases, um, the small parasites, the huge parasites like the varomites and the pests and the predators of the honeybees. It's all wrapped up and it's a three hours of uh, where we learn about what's happening in the honeybee health world. So you can sign up um, anytime. Also, this is the class schedule. We are about, I would say about halfway through. So if you know that uh, you are going to be gone or whatever, you can look and uh, we can also register. You can register for all the future classes, but all classes, um, Wendy is recording them. So you can always uh, request a class if you're gone and uh, for a fee, you will be able to uh, follow along. That's just what I just said, it read my mind. Um, so that you can register at this address. And the previously recorded pay, pay to view classes available. You can just email at um, camasterb at gmail.com, request whatever class that you would like to receive. And um, we'll uh, take uh, your information and we'll send you a link for a fee. So thank you so much for your um, Unconditioned love to me this morning and listening well. Thank you very much. And I will uh, stop here and I will be able to um, take any question you have about anything. <laughs>